uh, the three presenters today, you can see on the screen, John Hack from Interflexing going first, building an interpersonal skills coach. Next, Brian Healy from AERA on finding topics in financial transcripts. They will each speak for approximately 20 minutes with five minutes of Q&A, so 25 minutes total each. And then we'll have Vishnu Saran from StoryCube on interactive entertainment. So it should be a really interesting program. It is being recorded. And as I said a moment ago, the recordings will post to the YouTube channel. So we're just gonna go straight into the first presentation with John Hack from Interflexion. I don't do very extensive introductions. So I will ask John, invite John to um, introduce himself. I am, um, hmm. I am not seeing John's login here. I don't have John as, uh, I don't have John as uh, participating. I'm going to hope that Brian Healy is ready to give his presentation uh, because we can just move directly to him. So I'm going to enable Brian and I'm going to stop my own share. Uh, Brian, are you ready to do your presentation? Yep, I'm here. Uh, very good. If you want to start your video and start your application, uh, that was a bit of a surprise for you, but there you go. Uh, <laughs> uh, John on. So I'll uh, take it. Brian Healy from AERA, finding topics in financial transcripts. I'm going to go off video myself and, as I said, allow you to introduce yourself however you wish and go ahead with your presentation. Uh, so uh, you can share your screen and take it away. Uh, yeah, I, you are sharing your screen. So uh, very good. Sounds good. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I'll give a sort of really quick background on myself. I won't spend too much time on that. Um, my name is Brian Healy. I'm the CTO and one of the co-founders uh, at ERA. Uh, ERA specifically sells uh, intelligence tooling around uh, events. And we sort of describe events as um, uh, specifically for like the financial markets. <clears throat> and so for instance, earnings calls, conferences, um, you know, uh, shareholder meetings, investor presentations, um, information that sort of helps investors make uh, decisions on when and how they'll invest in various public companies. Um, and so, you know, our product is sort of full featured and it has uh, this concept of we, we connect to these events, we, we pipe the audio to our clients and we also transcribe the events. Um, and so that's sort of like the meat and potatoes of what we're offering. But a lot of times we end up in this place where we're trying to help the investor uh, or the analyst do their job faster uh, and more performantly. And so a lot of questions come to mind is how can we help them find important information in these, uh, these events more quickly um, and do it in a way that is adaptive and smart and sort of helps the analyst, you know, uh, work as efficiently as possible. And so one of the things I'm going to cover today is the work we've done recently in trying to identify topics that are primarily focused on these types of events, long form discussion events. So I'll, I'll start off with sort of like the general problem statement of, of what we do. I mean, topic modeling is nothing new. There's a lot of different approaches to how to identify topics, how to roll topics up into document views or segment views. Um, the specific criteria for which uh, topics in the financial world in this in this world of events are important uh, is is a couple of folds. So first is that it needs to be extremely adaptive. And so um, a, a more traditional labeled uh, trained model uh, would struggle in the world where it needs to be able to pick up new types of topics really rapidly. Um, and when I say really rapidly, I mean immediately. So, you know, if a management team uh, for a company discusses a new product that they've launched um, or, or, or at a conference of some kind, um, the model needs to be able to immediately recognize that as a topic and then be able to immediately recognize it as an important topic or be able to identify how important it might be for that given, uh, that given discussion. It also has to have a sense of historicity. It needs to understand what topics are relevant to the company itself over time, how those topics have trended over time and whether or not they are moving in or out of importance. Um, and then, of course, it also has to have sort of a holistic view on the entire document. Um, th this is sort of where we come into, I'm going to talk later about how we try to identify um, priority for a topic. So in any given long form event, you know, these earnings events can be 45 minutes to an hour long. There's about 30 minutes of like management team speaking and then a lot of Q&A. Um, the, there's going to be a lot of things discussed, especially for large public companies that have a lot of products and a lot of features. And so 
being able to identify what are the most prominent, important topics for that full event uh, and how do they relate to each other and how is that particular value changing and trending over time. So, you know, for a very high level example for a company like Amazon, uh, how does say AWS as a business line uh, compare to its uh, online store line? Like how, how are they talking about these topics and how is that discussion maybe moving from event to event or from quarter to quarter? So let's talk a little bit about how we set out to sort of solve this problem. Um, one of the, the the first pieces that we wanted to do was um, sort of provide topics at every layer. So the idea is that we wanted people to take topics from the ground level context and then expand them up through to the whole document and then even further up through to the entire company level and have context across all of those layers. Um, so obviously the baseline level is, can we identify topics at an individual sentence or a few sentences level? Um, and so that is much more traditionally and straightforwardly done. You know, we, we, I use a uh, custom built, but fairly traditional parts of speech and entity detection and resolution models to pull out all of the most important parts of speech for any given sentence or sentences, uh, identify and resolve the core entities, map those entities, of course, to, you know, the ontology data we have under the hood that lets us know what that thing is, if we have that information. So AWS, for instance, being known as an Amazon division tying it to various KPIs and underlying synonyms and sort of other features that we can we can use to associate uh, information. And then using uh, this hierarchy of information, if we have, for instance, uh, a resolved entity, it sort of gets a higher score versus a uh, non-resolved entity or, or a more traditional linguistic extracted subject. Um, but ultimately being able to identify what is the piece of text in any given sentence that is the subject of that sentence? What are they actually talking about? The benefits of doing it through a more linguistic structure as opposed to a labeled model is it allows us to be very flexible. We don't need to have ever seen the discussion point. It's just how the sentence is put together, um, the standard rules and structure of language. You know, um, And so we can take uh, many different layers of how deep we understand a given subject and sort of map them up and apply a lot of metadata to it to see how it fits in the, the full holistic view of the document. So for instance, now that we have topics extracted from various pieces of a given transcript in order as it's being discussed, we can marry it up with things like the uh, sentiment scoring of that particular discussion, um, the speaker who's talking, um, the prominence in the document. In other words, is it the first major subject that was discussed as the second, third, fourth? Um, how frequently is it discussed with uh, and, you know, a logarithmic decay to, to that value so it doesn't sort of overwhelm really highly discussed topics. Uh, of course, historical relevance and frequencies and just take this uh, bucket of metadata features and use them to create a heuristic to identify uh, essentially a sort and score across this full suite of, doc, uh, of topics we've extracted. So this allows us to sort of do interesting things. So we can, we can for instance, start to take this data uh, and use it as a jumping off point to help learn what's happening in an event. So like if, I, if I'm monitoring multiple companies and I don't necessarily have the time or ability to uh, watch say five or six concurrent events, it's important to be able to give people guiding posts. Like how can they move quickly through these long form documents, see when things are said. Um, and so it becomes reference points. Uh, when, you know, AWS is a very important topic for this given event, it was mentioned 17 times. Here are the times it was mentioned uh, in, in, you know, in, in priority order. And it sort of gives it a way to ignore the cruff of some of these long form uh, discussions where there's a lot of, a lot of talk, just it's very boilerplate, uh, a lot of filler, a lot of questions and answers you might not care about, allows you to sort of direct your, your work. Um, ultimately, too, this also allows us to sort of roll these topics up into a larger scale view of the company itself or even across company sectors or even globally. Um, and then, of course, we can roll that into analysis. We can sort of see interesting trends in that kind of data. So how has the prominence of a given topic changed from quarter to quarter? Um, be able to see that, you know, for instance, COVID, COVID-19 being a reference uh, uh, in, in earnings calls and seeing it appear suddenly in the first quarter, jump up to the most important topic, uh, you know, for a couple of quarters and then start to trend downward. Um, it allows us to sort of infer things and sort of drive a research process. What does that mean? Is COVID becoming a part of life for us now? Is it becoming less impactful to bottom line numbers? Uh, it helps the analysts and the in investors sort of do their job well. 
Um, but the ultimate goal here is also to sort of quickly identify those new features. So COVID being something that was never discussed before, um, you know, prior to say November in 2019, when it emerged into the news cycle uh, in, you know, in, in January, 2020, this model should have been able to instantly recognize it as a well-discussed topic. You know, it starts showing up in Amazon earnings calls, starts showing up in, in other companies' earnings calls. Uh, it's showing up in more and more prominent spaces and calls. And instead of identifying those trends uh, allows us to quickly identify when interesting things may be happening. And that sort of helps uh, investors with their, their research, helps them find new theses to sort of inform their investment decisions and just overall make the process uh, a little less painful for, for a group of people that tends to have to spend a lot of time uh, listening to these earnings events, uh, sometimes hours and hours, uh, and oftentimes they had a crush all at one time, help move that process along a little faster and make their lives a little easier. So that was sort of a very high level. Um, I, you know, we only had 20 minutes here and I wanted to leave plenty of time for Q and A. Um, I think we're about 13 minutes in. So um, I don't know if you want to take any questions. Uh, I'm actually not familiar how the question process works. Is it all through Q and A or is it, is it actually spoken? If anyone would like to ask a question now, uh, sounds like Brian would be willing to field some by audio. You can raise your hand and I will voice enable you or just enter your question via q and I don't see any yet, however. So why don't you go, why don't you keep going? So I, that's actually the, the uh, full presentation. If it's interesting to people, I can okay. also show a, uh, a, a quick sort of like view on how this gets used in the UI. Um, So I, I won't be too salesy. This is not designed for that purpose, but just sort of give you a, a quick view on sort of our UI and how this data is designed to be used. Um, the basic idea is, you know, as I was sort of describing, the, the primary use case for our product is this concept of events, live streaming events. And so we have uh, real-time transcription coming in from all these events as they unfold. Um, investors are able to sort of follow along if they want to, but the idea is that we also have this text, so we can we don't they don't have to physically read or listen to it. We can do some some quick analysis of it, uh, and that's what the topics are designed to do. So, like if I pull up a prior event, say an Amazon one that I was sort of describing, I can quickly see what are the primary topics for this particular event. Um, you know what what's being discussed, and then I can use that as a jumping point to sort of move through that event and quickly learn what is being discussed, how is it being discussed. Um, the idea being, this just sort of helps the investors sort of do their process a little bit more uh, seamlessly. Let me ask you a question about sure. uh, the technology. What do you use for entity extraction and so on, sentiment scoring and all of that? So we've we basically built uh, more traditional CRF extractors on top of Scikit. Um, it's, it's fairly sort of industry standard um, and works effectively enough for our process. Okay. Was it a, a hard training process? Uh, did you uh, have a lot of, uh, you know, your own data? Did you use uh, industry standard data sets? We use sort of a combination of industry standard data sets and layered in um, some of our own annotations across uh, the event transcripts we've collected. So we have about four and a half years of transcript data. Uh, and increasingly, we're just broadly across of our ML efforts, we're trying to use more and more of uh, pure transcript data to do as much training as we can. It's a bit of a scope problem. Uh, you know, transcripts mostly, you know, even in, in a space where we consider it a decent amount of data, we're processing about 40,000 events a year. But in the ML world, I mean, we're talking about, you know, somewhere on the order of about a million uh, individual records. So decent, but not overwhelming for, for the NLP space, but we're trying to do that as, more, as much as we can as uh, more often. Yeah, that was a question of Rohit Pandas from the chat about the data you're using for training. So all of the, the transcripts, are they freely available uh, out there? I would think that the formats are fairly irregular and that there yeah. are multiple speakers uh, mixed in there. Are, you know, are there complications here? There can be. So the primary way we try to solve for some of the data cleansing issues is bifurcating on different types. So earnings events tend to actually be much more standardized. They very a lot less sort of talking over each other or, or, or sort of uh, speaker swapping. Um, it's easier. Uh, there's also much more structure to the data it's collected itself. Um, we can get it from various vendors that have done some of that pre-cleaning and sort of organize the data uh, in a decent way. Conferences get a little more difficult. They're a little more free form. And then of course we even have some that are just genuine phone calls and uh, for like a, a investor conference line, things like uh, things like that. 
Um, so we'd usually bifurcate along those and, and train for each individual use case. So like there's an earning specific uh, training set that we'll do for sentiment training for some of the topic extraction. Um, it limits our scope again. So now we're down from 40,000 events to closer to like 10, 15,000 events. Cause I mean, earnings events are four times a year. Uh, you know, it's much more standardized and schedule, um, but it allows us to keep that data a little bit more consistent. Yeah, Rohit, did you want to follow up? Uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks very much for asking. Uh, you've actually, uh, thanks, Brian. You've an answered lots of lots of my questions. But you did mention that these are transcripts, so I, I just had a thought in my mind. As in, did you uh, collect this primary information yourself, or did you get it from elsewhere? It's actually a mix of both. So we we have worked with some vendors to sort of build a back history. We started transcribing live events um, full time just last year. Uh, no. Year before last year, 2019, um, and so we've got about 18 months of our own history. Um, we we obviously need a slightly deeper history than that to do some of the work we're doing, and so we have backfilled with vendors, and we then okay. utilize those vendor partnerships to do some UI specific things with published and so forth. But um, so it's a, it's a mix of both. Oh, okay, great. Thanks very much. So we have some questions in the Q and A. Uh, let me read them to you. Uh, we have Risha Gupta who says, "This is interesting." One thing I wanted to understand is how do you validate the patterns you have identified in the data? Yeah, interesting. So because it's not a label, it's not like a traditional labeled model, it's sort of a multi-step heuristic with some modeling work sort of layered in between to help that heuristic along. Um, for the most part, we have we don't have more traditional validation. We're not running sort of like a validated scope set at the end of a training process. Um, we've we have essentially collected a series of, of uh, I call golden examples. Um, they're, they're transcripts that we've just manually reviewed, sort of identified our own sets of core topics and we want the model to perform at least up to par. Um, and so every time I make an adjustment to so the heuristic or adjustment to the training, um, we'll run it through that set and see how well it performs against that, that uh, core set of like a hundred events. Um, and then beyond that, a lot of eyeball testing in, 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 in the wild and see how it's doing. We've spent a lot of time sort of like going over aggregate metrics of topics, uh, seeing new topic sets and, and sort of doing our own sort of um, continued analysis. Okay, um, we have a question uh, and person didn't enter a name. Uh, do topics populate in real time as a transcript is live or is there a time lag before the model has the proper hierarchy? So they do, so the, we, we We've sort of, there is this sort of general problem of uh, the topic model itself is designed to take the totality of the document in place. So like position in the document matters, frequency in the document matters, and of course speaker and speaker frequency matters. And there's various other sort of metadata features that are relevant to that. So it's, uh, we've essentially solved for this by, we do do a continuous build on live events, um, but those are specifically ethereal. It's sort of a guideline. Like these are the estimated topics as the as the event unfolds, and then we do a final run uh, at once the event is concluded to to bake in sort of like the final set of topics. And so during a live event, it's designed to be a little more of a guideline. Uh, and analysis is performed on the final uh, set. Okay, and we have one more question. Do you have a history of topics for specific equities? How many equities and how big history? We do actually, yeah. So uh, as I was mentioning, we, we try to roll this up uh, as, as high as we can get, which in this case can be all the way up to like global. Um, but equity is a level that we sort of keep aggregate views on. We cover about uh, 10, uh, about 10,000 equities worldwide. Uh, and we have calculated topics for, I believe about 8,500 of them. Um, we sort of have some thresholds for how much history we need to have on the company to, to, to calculate a decent event set. We don't want to just mirror the last event and so forth. Um, so there's still some small gaps there, but it's got pretty comprehensive coverage. Okay. So uh, audience members, okay, we have uh, one more that's popped up. We have uh, Rana Vera Reddy, Sir Riggy Reddy. Okay, uh, I'm interested to know if you use any custom models using topic modeling algorithms like LDA or use third party services. We specifically haven't. Um, so like uh, LDA is a sort of a specific example where every time I've played with LDA in the wild, it seems to perform excellently in validation, excellently in vitro and struggles a lot when I get it out into sort of the wild. I've done it on like some news-based topic modeling. Um, and we have, uh, and I'll say this as delicate as I can, a very fussy client base. And I see that in a, in a positive way. Like it's a, it's a, it's a set that there's a lot on the line. They're very professional and they need to get these things right. And so we've, 
we've tried to focus as much as we can on putting guardrails uh, in the model. That's why we, we lean a lot on heuristics. There's some modeling under the hood to help guide the heuristics, but there's also a lot of, uh, of rules applied alongside it. And so we've tended to, to move away from, from more traditional open modeling techniques um, for this case. We use a little bit more um, vanilla modeling in, in our news-based analysis, which is a little bit, uh, little bit more um, exploratory, I'll say. Okay. We have a question from Bill Sheffel. Are you using NSQL? Can you elaborate on how it supports NLU? And I'm actually not familiar with NSQL. I don't know what NSQL is either. Um, some some particular form of SQL. Oh, NoSQL. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so no, we, uh, well, I mean, I guess we don't have traditional NoSQL. Like I'm not using uh, Mongo or anything under the hood. We, we use uh, Aurora as our backend database system and we leverage S3 heavily to store artifacts. Um, and so it's not like straight up SQL across the board. We're not storing raw text data in our database or anything like that. Um, but I could definitely envision where NoSQL will be valuable in this modeling. Uh, you know, as, as most use cases where you're using text for analysis, you don't store the text in any database. It's just too freeform and too large. You use the database to store metadata and, and records, and then you go and fetch the data, uh, you know, the raw data elsewhere. Um, and obviously NoSQL could shine there. It just isn't the way we've implemented. All right. Well, thanks for this presentation, Brian. I found it really interesting. Uh, Thank you. So uh, we're going to switch to our next speaker. Uh, Brian was the first of three. Our next speaker is going to be John Hack, who um, is from Interflection. And John is going to be speaking on building an interpersonal skills coach, combining computational linguistics with Google's NLU API. Uh, let's see, John, you should be um, enabled to share your screen and video. Yes, there you are. There we go. Okay. And Hello, everyone. Give it a few more seconds and uh, take it away. John, please introduce yourself however you wish. And I'm looking forward to what you have to say. Okay. So uh, first, let's just make sure everyone sees the the screen that they should be seeing. Uh, good. You oh, want to go into presentation? Well, can you, you I'm seeing your presentation oh, interface that's... rather than just the slides. That's that... good. Okay. Yes. So um, hi, everybody. Uh, we're going to talk about natural language processing, and I'm probably going to talk a little bit more about natural language than processing today. And uh, I, I hope you find it interesting. Uh, a little bit about me, uh, and of course, a couple of my colleagues, co-founders there on the side, but uh, a, a very long time ago, I studied uh, math, computers, AI, linguistics, and economics at MIT. And back in the 80s, I worked in Wang Labs Natural Language Processing R&D Labs, uh, long before the era of machine learning. I've spent a long career in analytics, including uh, some work on large-scale statistical data mining, and then eight years uh, leading SAP's Performance Management Innovation Lab, which is where I met Nick. Um, he and I have patents relating to semantics of business uh, information. And uh, after some machine learning projects at Capital One, I uh, joined these gentlemen in co-founding Interflection. So that's a little bit of my history. Uh, you know, one of the interesting projects we worked on there was uh, working with NFL teams to understand player performance. And they don't just look at the stats, like how fast and how uh, far they can throw but they look at their ability to be effective teammates and to collaborate and to work together. And a lot of the research we did at SAP led us to the notion that interpersonal skills really are at the heart of organizational performance. And we thought, you know, how can we improve interpersonal skills today? Uh, it turns out that, you know, trying to learn how to take a coaching mindset is not something you can get from an online video. Personal coaching is great. It's really the gold standard, but it's also really, really expensive. And so what we have is a lot of folks, I mean, I'm not gonna ask a poll here, but you know, how many of you have had the opportunity to work with a personal coach to develop your, uh, your interpersonal skills, right? Uh, most of us haven't had that. But we thought, you know, uh, coaching really is a natural language 
understanding, a natural language processing undertaking. And if we could coach people at scale with NLP based role play, we might be able to you know, lift up a lot of folks in their careers. So uh, we uh, wanna give you some context for the app, then we'll talk about what we've built and there will be a, a recorded demo in a little bit, but I wanted to sort of explain what it is we've created. So you know, we let people talk in their natural voice through a FaceTime-like interface. And they're presented with a situation and then they say what they would say to a colleague over the phone if they were faced with that situation at work. Software then analyzes the content of what they've said. We've got analytics that break down interpersonal skills into uh, measurable behaviors. We analyze vocabulary, pronoun antecedent relationships, sentence structure, semantic similarity, and so forth. And we you know, then use that to provide feedback on whether they are, for example, taking a coaching mindset or not. Uh, for those of you whose you know, BS detectors are flashing red right now, uh, let's be clear, we have not solved the AGI problem. This is not a general uh, intelligence we, uh, in fact, have a, created a narrow AI solution based on being able to highly constrain the context of the conversation. So, uh, you know, just wanted to make that clear up front that a lot of what we've done here is a function of context that we're able to model and then use in the analysis. So, uh, I know many of you have likely uh, seen these examples before, but I think they're worth revisiting because they're very important to understanding the challenges that we face in understanding what people say when they talk. Um, pronoun antecedent relationships. You know, if you do not know that zebras are eaten by lions, it's very hard to know what it is referring to in that sentence, uh, in that first set of sentences. Uh, you know, a plastic cup is made of plastic, but a plastic factory is not made of plastic and a coffee cup is not made of coffee. Uh, so there's a lot of what turns out to be missing text behind all natural utterances. And one of the biggest challenges in, you know, understanding what people are talking about, obviously, is knowing the context in which they're operating. So we had this big idea, let's help people uh, develop their interpersonal skills with an AI coach and all of these problems that, that you guys are familiar with. So our vision had to meet some reality. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, most of us don't have enough money to fund a, a major research uh, undertaking. We also don't have, and I don't believe anyone has a large body of data that's conversations that take place, say, between managers and directs, between executives and their peers, and that are well tagged with the nature of what's being conversed. So we knew we weren't going to solve an AGI problem here, and we knew that meaning was going to be hard to model. The good news is, in fact, that this is not a classification problem. Uh, and and, and the, the reason that's good news is because we didn't have enough uh, data. We didn't have the data. So, uh, and, and I want to talk about this a little bit more. And, uh, you know, we, 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 we say it's not a classification problem because it's not enough to say you've given a good answer or you've given a bad answer. When you give feedback to someone, you have to be very specific about what they did right or wrong. You took the wrong point of view on this problem. You focused on the wrong thing and you gave poor advice you really should have been recommending this rather than that. And so in order to do that, we were, were, we were gonna have to go beyond what you might call a, a classification problem. So uh, fortunately, you know, machine learning uh, had solved a lot of key problems, speech to text, part of speech tagging, syntactic structures and so forth. And we were working with a highly constrained context. So, uh, we asked ourselves, what could we learn about processing meaning by looking at how humans actually process meaning? And uh, you know, I'm gonna use one example here that's uh, pretty straightforward, 
But humans do resolve ambiguities by combining different layers and making sure that everything is consistent across the layers. So let's take a sentence, the complex houses married soldiers. Um, you know, when most people begin processing this sentence, they initially tag complex as an adjective, houses as a uh, noun, and that noun phrase is followed by the verb, uh, you know, married. So it begins to make sense. But once you put it all together in that form, it's not the case that houses are marrying soldiers. That just doesn't make sense at a semantic level. And it certainly doesn't make sense at a pragmatic level. So we go back, we say, okay, that didn't work given the context of the conversation. What would be a, another way of parsing that sentence where the words complex and houses actually made sense? So we, as humans, change the uh, order of noun phrases or the structure of the noun phrases and the verb phrases and we have a meaningful analysis of the utterance at that point. So our hybrid architecture actually combines all of those techniques. So we, we have a user response that's combined with the context definition for that response. Uh, and, you know, get a little bit more into that shortly. Uh, and using symbolic logic and statistical inference on top of those or alongside those machine learning techniques, we can provide detailed analysis and feedback that not only says, hey, you said or didn't say the right thing, but why? What was it about what you said that was right or wrong? So I'm going to switch gears here for a moment and uh, play a short two to three minute video of the application um, in action. So just give me a moment while I uh, you know, switch out of modes and uh, switch to a different app. That one, go full screen. So the situation here is that Jackie has come to you, her manager, asking you to intervene with a person you work, that she's working with who isn't getting his work done, but she's supposed to be leading the project. So what is the right response to someone Responsible with that problem? for pulling everything together, which you know, takes a lot of time but Oscar hasn't even given me a draft. Can you tell him he needs to get this to me right away? Now our learner has to respond, as if on a video call with Jackie. Well, Oscar should be able to do this. His previous manager recommended him, and he's done good work in the past. Do you know why he hasn't gotten his work done? Interflection is now analyzing what was said. Overall, not so good. Key ideas were missed and he took the wrong perspective on the problem. Let's dig into this a little more. Perspective is key and the software is asking him not to focus so much on Oscar and suggests focusing on the person he's talking to. He also needs to touch on themes of persuasion and collaboration. It's now clear to John that this is about Jackie, not Oscar. At least he asked Jackie what she thought. Time to try again. We can skip Jackie's lament. Jackie, when you're responsible for a report, you're on the hook. You need to get the team to get things done. You're going to have to figure out a way to get that report done. Doing better. He's rightfully focused on Jackie's situation and that she's responsible. But our learner still hasn't really provided any guidance into how she might get unstuck. He can play back his response and see how he looked and sounded. Having watched himself, the learner unlocks access to an expert level response. Let's see what that response. I'm going to jump over the expert response and uh, just go to the last uh, analysis here. This is just a few more seconds. Uh, 
She needs to collaborate with and use her influence on Oscar. Let's try this one more time. Jackie, when you're responsible for a report, you're responsible for getting the team to pull that report together. You have to convince people to do the work even when they have competing priorities. Collaboration is a must. What do you think an effective next step might be? Our learner has taken the right perspective. He's given Jackie suggestions and asked her to take the next steps. That's what a coaching mindset looks like in action. Let's take a look at a So that's the software in action. Um, uh, let's take a little a look at a little bit more at what's under the hood and you know, how we use the Google NLU as input to that and uh, talk about what we learned from the first release and where we go from here. So uh, Google's NLU output, and by the way, uh, as we saw in the previous, uh, Presentation: Amazon, you know, Microsoft, and others also provide you know very interesting NLU uh, uh, insights. But we chose Google, and they do a very good job of providing the text, uh, speech to text, and information about that text, including you know obviously the parts of speech, the lemmas, and a lot of the morphology, mood, number, case, and so forth. All of those are very useful for understanding what someone is talking about. And you know, uh, when you want to do bag of words analysis, for example, it's great to be able to know whether a word is, like houses is being used as a noun or a verb in that particular sentence. Um, but above the layers of you know, syntax, Google also provides information about salience and sentiment. So, uh, you know, the salience is uh, fairly useful because it helps us understand what a machine learning model believes is the core focus of a conversation. Um, we don't rely on this entirely, but, you know, like a human intelligence, we try to use multiple inputs and, you know, compare them and have rules around that to say, okay, this makes more sense than that. So we're going to go with this as, as the solution. Um, and at the very highest level of pragmatics, Google provides sentiment. And uh, at a fairly coarse grained level, is it you know, sort of a low, medium, high? Are you being positive? Are you being neutral? Are you being negative? Um, and that brings us to you know, sort of what are some of the things we learned along the way? So uh, on the bad news side, the sentiment analysis kept shifting, and I'm sure many of you who've uh, worked with machine learning models know that whether you're using a third party model like a Google or your own models, as you retrain those models, as those models evolve, the results you get from them change. Uh, so we have to stay on top of the, the Google model to see how sentiment keeps changing. Um, that is based on you know, the large body of what people say and write on the internet. Uh, very different from what you see in a workplace in many cases. So uh, that, that's a challenge. Transcription errors. I'm sure you've all experienced, those of you who work with voice, that transcription errors are common. Uh, we did have a higher rate of false negatives than we expected. So we were saying, hey, you're not, you're not covering the right topic, even though people were covering the right topic. Um, and, and we've had to work to uh, you know, broaden the software's ability to glean meaning uh, from an utterance. And uh, on the next slide, I'll, I'll share with you one of the main areas uh, of, of research that we're actively undertaking right now. Um, the, uh, another thing we found was that indirect questions were very common. An indirect question obviously is where you're not saying, you know, when will you bring me my coffee? But something like, it would be nice if you brought me some coffee. It's not phrased in the form of a question, but it's a request nonetheless. And in the workplace, that is a very common uh, way for people to express uh, a question is, is, is in, indirectly. So we had to uh, develop uh, algorithms that would look for other 
markers of indirect questions that the Google NLU and other NLU systems wouldn't flag because they were looking for, you know, the who, what, when, where, why uh, structures. Um, and salience is limited to simple concepts. So uh, it recognizes that, you know, Oscar is a person, but it's not sure what to do with a report. Uh, so uh, useful as input, but, but limited. Uh, good news, uh, aspiring professionals did like the app. So people found it helpful in developing their skills. We, we, we ran a large pilot where uh, uh, professionals who had recently been promoted to a managerial role were preparing for uh, year-end conversations with their people. And it was very helpful in, you know, how do you tell someone that their performance isn't as good as they thought it was going to be, for example. You know, what are the things that you say and how do you say them? Um, one of the things I, I do want to highlight about what we've done is that it does not require keyword matching. You don't have to say things the way other people say it. You can choose your own words that are synonyms. You can structure things differently. Um, the transcription errors were mostly minor, uh, fortunately. The bag of words statistical analyses worked well, uh, surprisingly well. So in, in that case, that's where we basically throw away the syntactic structures and just look at word frequencies and other aspects of the, uh, of, of the uh, how to describe it. We look at word frequencies. We, we look at uh, strength of words and can use that to, to glean meaning. Um, the interaction model was embraced and most importantly, we now have a body of data that we can work with going forward of sample utterances. So the big, the big news though, that, 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 we're, that we, we found makes things different from a lot of analysis that you'll see out there is that spoken language is not like written text. Um, people will say things like, like, like this uh, utterance here. What's interesting about uh, a, a long complex sentence like this is that when it is spoken in conversation, the listener has no problem understanding it in context. It doesn't feel awkward to the speaker or to the listener. It's a very natural, meaningful conversation. And yet using the tools that have primarily been developed for written text, uh, makes it very hard to uh, parse and to carve up into chunks of meaning. So uh, with that, you know, we're just about done here. What we're working on, obviously, are the transcription errors. How can we fix transcription errors based on meaning? Uh, sometimes it's trivial. Um, sometimes it can change the meaning. If you remove the word if from that middle sentence, it turns out that uh, it changes the meaning and that is the what the person actually said that the, uh, the, perhaps it was a verbal tick that resulted in the introduction of the word if to the sentence. Uh, sometimes the word, the, the, the sentence just looks like nonsense. Uh, we do know what that person was trying to say, uh, but uh, the transcription didn't quite catch it. Uh, we're working on improving our context definition so, you know, our context is based on today the entities that are relevant to the conversation. Uh, it's not, an, it, 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 it's not uh, a, a broad, generic model of all things. It's very narrowly defined. And as we improve that, it will embrace more uh, broad concepts. And then regarding the natural speech, right? Parsing run-on sentences and handling sentence fragments are really essential to uh, the uh, ability of the software to understand what someone's trying to say. So uh, it's a lot to solve, but, you know, exciting problems to solve. And when we solve them, it will be uh, helpful to, uh, aspiring professionals and uh, we, we look forward to, to getting that out there. So thank you for your time and attention and uh, let's open the floor up to questions.
You know, John, uh, let me take the uh, liberty of asking you a first question. I found this really interesting, and it leaves me with more questions uh, than when I started, which is a good sign. Uh, so uh, let's consider something that's going around on the internet. Yeah, someone says, that's a really interesting idea. Uh, you know, okay, British person, that means that's totally bonkers. Uh, no way I'm going to do that. Versus an American hears, that's a really interesting idea as literally. How do you deal with cultural differences, but also with bias, uh, you know, that there might be cultural biases uh, built into your models. Are you dealing with that kind of thing? Yeah, that's a, Seth, that's a great question. And it's something that we, we are tackling head on. So one, of, and I'll, I'll, I'll even narrow it down even further. Uh, two, two companies that I've worked for, SAP and Capital One. SAP is a, culturally, it's a German engineering company. Uh, people are very direct, uh, and uh, you know, there's it, it, it's all about finding the right answer. Um, and at Capital One, it's a southern-based, much more genteel financial services firm where you know other people's feelings are very important, and you have to be much more careful when you're you, when you're solving problems, not to just like you know bulldozer through. So we see those cultural differences. I think not only. Uh, you know, country to country, but uh, organization to organization. And we've specifically designed the context definition ability to incorporate some of those differences. Um, right now, we recognize that we're primarily focused on American English um, and English specifically. We, we, we haven't yet even explored what it would take to convert this to French or uh, Chinese. But uh, the, the, the key is to make it transparent how, you know, what the context is that we're looking for. And uh, you are uh, able to configure the system with, you know, if there are phrases that people should or should not be using or ideas that people should or should not be promoting, uh, those can be coded in uh, very easily. Okay, you have a question from Terry Lee in the chat. I'm curious, does your tool help the user strike a balance between practicing and learning theory and concepts as both are necessary to improve? Absolutely. And, and right now we're very focused on the practice side of that equation. And you know, we work, we're looking to work with and have been working with both learning and development organizations within companies, as well as uh, consulting firms that provide uh, training and coaching services so that our app works within the context of that broader set of curriculum. So it could be, for example, the, the online, you know, let's take the example of feedback. Um, and uh, it's often the case that people are told, look, feedback has to be behavioral, it has to be specific, and it has to explain consequences, right? You get that in the, in the training, but how do you get an opportunity to practice that, you know? And our software allows you to practice saying, hey, Joe, whenever you roll your eyes, whenever Susie is talking, it makes me think you're not really serious about the problem that we're trying to solve. What can you do differently, right? And until that just flows naturally. So you're absolutely right. It has to be in the context of that, uh, what, the, the, the abstraction, the knowledge, but practice is critical for these interpersonal skills. Well, you've actually invited a question, something I was thinking of, someone rolls their eyes, or maybe the person is not looking at the uh, person who's on the screen. Um, and then there's also, well, you know, people, um, uh, well, I was trying to model it, uh, they have uh, filler words, you know, um, and so right. on. Uh, are you looking at not, at verbal signals, not just the words, and are also at analyzing the video, uh, the gaze, uh, whether the person is smiling, what kind of impression, uh, that expression the person has. That is a lot to add to this, but maybe you're looking at those things. So the short answer is today, we analyze the, the, what the words that they say laid out as text. Uh, we've looked at those other aspects of it and, and a few things I'd like to, to share. In, uh, if you, we've seen research that is, that calls into question the validity of uh, expression analysis. 
And we're, we're skeptics today about the ability to use expressions to infer uh, you know, what a person is trying to convey. What we do allow is for the person to play themselves back and see what they look like in the, in the interaction. And we've heard from users that that's actually super valuable, especially for the, 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 the young managers. It's like, oh my God, I had no idea I looked like that when I was talking to my people. Um, and uh, the last thing I wanted to mention is filler words. While filler words are generally to be avoided in presentations, in conversation, in one-on-one -on -one conversation, they actually play a role, uh, various different roles. As someone perhaps gathers their thoughts between two ideas, they can use filler words to indicate that they want to continue talking rather than creating an opening for that person to start talking back. So while it seems like it's an unnecessary thing, it's actually an important human behavior and interaction. So we do not, uh, in our software, try to change filler words uh, for the most part, uh, how you want to structure your sentences. It's okay if you run on for a little bit. We're, we're letting you be speaking. We, we want you to speak naturally in your own voice and feel comfortable doing that. That's what's most important for the scenarios that we're looking at. All right, well, um, thanks very much, uh, John. We're going to go on to our final of the three speakers whom I'm going to enable now. So let's um, give me a second, a few seconds to do that. And that third speaker is uh, Vishnu Saran, who is with a startup called StoryCube that does interactive entertainment. And Vishnu, you should be, yes, you're on screen if you'd like to start your video and start your, and unmute yourself. And you should be able to share your presentation as soon as I stop sharing that screen. I see you on screen. Okay. Very good, uh, you guys good? Yeah, uh, Go ahead should I start? Sharing. Awesome. So thank you, Seth, for um, inviting me on this panel, and uh, it's a pleasure to talk to your meetup and all the attendees that are present over here. Uh, the earlier two sessions were wonderful. Um, so let me just introduce myself, and then I'll start sharing my screen. So I'm Vishnu. Um, I'm the founder of a company called StoryCube. So StoryCube is like an interactive platform for uh, immersive stories and games that users can play on their voice-enabled devices. So let me just quickly uh, get to the presentation. So we call ourselves Netflix for voice. Now, a lot of people over here who are enthusiastic about voice and NLU in general and NLP uh, must have interacted with Alexa devices, Google Home Assistant and other uh, voice enabled devices like Fire TV, etc. But while we know that we can play interactive stories and games on these devices, it's becoming more difficult to search and discover good content on these platforms. Because of the simple reason that uh, it's just the beginning of this entire ecosystem and uh, there's a steep learning curve for people to know uh, what are the good uh, voice design practices, what is the technology uh, that's involved with it. So let me just talk about interactive entertainment and um, you know why, why is this important uh, at this particular juncture in time. Voice, it's everywhere. Right now you see 112 million monthly active users who are using these voice enabled devices for various tasks. We can see 4.2 billion devices, which are mobile phones and all of them are uh, voice assistants. We see 200 million smart speakers that are already sold. 80 million devices uh, in the form of smart TVs are now being voice enabled. And voice is everywhere and it is here to stay. Uh, it's growing at a pace of 30% CAGR. But there isn't enough interactive content. If you take the Alexa skill store, uh, out of the 200,000 skills or the many thousands of Google actions, 50% are stories and games. Although in these 50%, less than 1% are professionally produced. What I mean by professionally produced is 
um, giving a lot of thought into the voice design principles, giving a lot of emphasis on audio production and making sure that the experience is truly immersive and not just uh, a conversation with a bot. So I believe that this 1% of professionally produced content, uh, which is truly immersive, is the only thing that is worth commercializing. And that's exactly what we want to curate at Storycube. And, and future is immersive. If you see the content that has been, uh, that is already there today. And when I say content, I'm specifically talking about stories. Storytelling has evolved over the last thousands of years and uh, it has take, taken many forms and shapes, but majority of it put the audience in a third person point of view. So we either watch, listen, or read the story. But in the future, we can participate in the story. We can interact with other characters in the story using our voice. Uh, there's going to be gesture recognition involved. We can explore multiple metaverses and universes uh, with our free will. And obviously, we can read, listen, watch, uh, and do all the things that we can do today as well. And most importantly, we can uh, be social. We can experience a story along with our friends uh, or our family and enjoy the entire universe uh, together as a team. So that is where the future is and uh, future is going to be immersive in this format. We also see this uh, in the form of growing trends with rise in interactive storytelling, right? So you see Netflix uh, producing a lot of interactive stories like Bandersnatch with Black Mirror, Minecraft story mode. There's also Boss Baby, which was converted into interactive stories. And then there's this company called Wattify recently uh, funded by Andreessen Horowitz. And it's an interactive video storytelling platform. And you guys should check it out. It's pretty cool. Um, and there have been apps which for the last one decade uh, called Choices Episodes, where there are interactive stories where you read the story and touch to choose your decision. And the story goes in different directions. And this industry itself is making around $500 million already. And uh, new startups in the space have already received 300 million in funding. But what if this interactive storytelling is enhanced by uh, taking them to the voice platforms and the voice devices? It's going to be truly immersive. And this kind of content is what is ideal uh, for voice devices. Where did all of this interactive storytelling start? I mean, humans have always wanted to participate and the attention span of humans have uh, decreased over the last many decades. Um, so there are a lot of people who wanted to participate in a universe that they really love. Dungeons and Dragons, uh, it started in 1974 and it's a very popular RPG game and it's, it's, it's considered as the holy grail of our RPG games, right? And you can see a lot of students, a lot of kids playing uh, this game in their basements, in their garages, uh, and whenever they have uh, some sort of time. Because inherently, uh, as uh, audience, we just don't want to be a passive observer of a story that's on our screen, but we want to be an active participant. And this was propelled further uh, with choose your own adventure kind of books. Um, this was very popular in 1980s and 90s. Uh, I mean, some people who are in this audience who are from the US must be familiar with uh, Edward Packard's uh, choose your own adventure stories or uh, Montgomery's uh, stories, which were uh, called game books, I think, uh, back in the day, where if you have to take a decision, you have to move to page 64 or page 32. And there's like a whole set of people who love these books and uh, who are nostalgic about these stories even now. And these stories are perfect for something like a voice device, because these are truly immersive. And without the tediousness of skipping through pages, you can just talk to the device, participate in the story and experience the story going in different directions. So this is something that I'm very excited about. And some examples uh, that are there in the Alexa skills ecosystem right now uh, that I'd like to touch upon, and all of you can try it out to understand the truly immersive stories in the space are Detective X. Th this game was made by uh, Budgie Studio, and um, it's an interactive immersive detective game where you are the detective. And uh, you need to identify who the murderer is. And you need to do this by taking some clever steps uh, choosing your decisions wisely and um, listening to everything that has been given, all the information that has been given to you very carefully. So if you take one small step, which is uh, which uh, can, it, it can prove to be a disaster, right? One wrong step and you might just end up failing in the mission. 
So these kind of games uh, where uh, the user is in the center uh, stage of the story is going to be pretty cool. There's also another game called Journey 3000. Uh, it's an adaptation of uh, Edward Packard's Choose Your Own Adventure story. This is by far my favorite Alexa skill in the entire ecosystem, right? It has 32 different possible endings and it takes place thousand years from the present timeline. And it's, it's, it's like the paradise for science fiction lovers. So uh, you are in a space capsule floating in space thousand years from now, and then you need to explore uh, planets like Mars, Venus, and Earth, and uh, try to make decisions on whether you would want to escape to safety or uh, save the entire humankind from a tyrant. There are also small, smaller games like Alpaca, Alpa, Alpaca, which is uh, a game which we produced. So this is a party game, right? So it's, it's a party game where uh, there is no right answer, wrong answer. It's a story about a cheerful alpaca that keeps on singing cheerful songs, which make no sense. So kids below five years, they love to repeat after their favorite character. And then even though it doesn't make sense, they just want to sing along. So this is like a perfect party game that you can try. So Vishnu, are you able to uh, move us uh, your presentation into the story cube technology? Uh, uh, talk about the natural language processing aspects for us. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay, let me jump to, okay, you understand that uh, these interactive experiences are vital, but how do we design it? And uh, who would we design it for? So majority of these users are going to be kids. And uh, when we are designing a conversation for kids, we have to make sure that it's absolutely appealing. So uh, there are five commandments, as I say, uh, with respect to voice user interface design. So we have to design a conversation and not an IVR system. So uh, if you see the NLU, uh, the, the progress of NLU that's happening so far, and uh, so many different technologies that are uh, at our disposal right now, it's very easy for you to uh, design a truly conversational um, bot where uh, you don't give options like uh, say one for X, Y, Z, say two for uh, some other option, but you actually keep the conversation open-ended. So when, when you're designing uh, any of your bots, uh, which you want to be truly conversational, uh, just like an experience of a interactive story, you need to ensure that um, you anticipate all sorts of user behavior. For example, um, if a user says help, or if the user says, hey, uh, who is this particular character? You should be able to answer these questions uh, as if you are uh, telling a story in person and trying to uh, counter uh, spontaneous questions. So this is one voice design principle that we need to follow. And then use a voice artist for emotional appeal. So see, using voice artists is obviously an expensive affair. So there are companies like Replica.ai and uh, Liarbird, which are creating synthesis uh, of uh, human-like voices, uh, but with text-to-speech. So text-to-speech technologies can be leveraged and different technologies provided by Amazon, like Amazon Poly and other um, frameworks can be used to make sure that there is an emotional appeal that is attached to uh, the entire experience. Surprise the users with diverse set of responses. So if let's say the response is thank you, uh, make sure, thank you for playing this game. Please come back next time. Make sure that these responses are diverse in nature. So one time you would say thank you and the other time you would say, hope you enjoyed the game. Uh, just a diverse set of responses for so that you don't make it very monotonous. So this would surprise the users and would uh, you know be etched in their mind. Use music and audio cues to create uh, identification, which we call audio branding. So all of you must be familiar with the Netflix starting sound, right? Uh, everyone immediately when you listen to that, you know it's Netflix. Or you would probably associate with the music uh, with of Rocky uh, Balboa, right? So um, audio cues and audio branding is going to be pivotal in making sure that your experience um, is truly immersive. Like whenever there's a antagonist coming in the story, you have a negative theme associating with it. So it's, it's very fascinating how we as humans can associate audio to uh, emotions. And also remember the context to make the conversation less annoying. So uh, as you progress through the game, you understand the decisions that they're making and you store them so that when they're starting the next episode or when they're starting wherever they're left off, uh, you don't want them to go through a certain bit of the story 
entirely again. You have to remember place where they left off. And you can do this using uh, session attributes if you're creating an Alexa skill uh, or a Google action. Or if you're creating a custom NLP application that runs on a, a mobile device, make sure that you have a facility to uh, store it either locally or uh, uh, try to hit an API to know where the user has left off uh, before and how many points has he already scored or other uh, in-game elements that he might have. So uh, this, web, this presentation that I created, it's mostly for uh, letting you know the uh, consequences of making content truly immersive and uh, the design principles that you need to follow in order to execute that uh, using the existing NLU uh, frameworks that we have. Now, if you have any questions, I'm open to answer that. If we have any questions for Vishnu, you can use the Q&A, or if you raise your hand, I will voice enable you. Any takers? Well, I'm not seeing any. Um, so uh, Vishnu, let me thank you for your presentation. And that wraps up our program for today. I will just mention that uh, you can get in touch with me if you'd like to propose a presentation for a future meetup, you can send me an email message or message me through the meetup platform. We will post video of today's presentation to the YouTube channel. Uh, you should see a screen now with the address for the meetup videos. And once again, thank you to our sponsor, John Snow Labs. And our next program will be June the 2nd with Zach Lipton, professor from Carnegie Mellon University, learning the difference that makes a difference counterfactually augmented data. Whichever meetup you replied to in order to get to our program today, you should be able to reply to that program uh, now. And then we also have a program posted uh, only on the New York meetup at this point for June the 15th with people from Amazon, one former Amazon, on the data tuner technology. I'm waiting to post that to other meetups and to announce it until we have a full description of that program. So thanks everyone for joining us today. Send me a note if you wish to give a talk or have any questions or concerns, and we'll see you next time.